welcome back. It has now been three months since the crash of Spaceship Two in eastern Kern County. That spaceship represented the leading edge of America's emergent space tourism industry, and the mishap sent a shudder through the hearts and minds of the dreamers and the doers on Kern County's high desert. Critics wonder if any but the companies with the deepest of pockets can afford to do private space flights safely. But one thing the tragic accident last October has demonstrated is that the spirit of innovation is alive and well at Mojave Air and Spaceport, where a community of entrepreneurs have turned the corner and are moving on. Tonight, a 17 News exclusive as we take you deep inside the most promising space flight projects being developed on Kern County's high desert. Second, the vehicle's on the ground. On the ground. Our accident was a tough day for the uh, entire company. Any time that you go through experiences in your life, and especially a tragic one, one parachute north of Cone Lake, it can test your resolve. There were two people on the plane. They only got one shoot. And then the questions start bubbling to the surface inside every one of us. It was like, wow, uh, why are we in this business? Part of the answer to that question can be found at the entrance to Mojave Air and Spaceport. Imagination flies here, and sometimes imagination flies in the face of fate. Dreamers encounter setbacks that sometimes exact a human toll. Nobody that I work with thinks that we were going to evolve into the next phase of human transportation without a mishap in the R&D phase. And so, after another gut-wrenching reminder that they work in a risky business, the Mojave Air and Spaceport family is moving forward. There are test schedules and timelines to be met. The momentum that's been generated here by private spaceflight companies is a force to be reckoned with. In fact, in the wake of the crash of Spaceship Two, there's been a spike in Virgin Galactic ticket sales. Five seconds to go. We have a lot of people who, who just said, you know, this is too important. And, uh, and you guys got to keep going. California's high desert is hallowed ground. The airspace over it steeped in aviation history. This place where we broke the sound barrier, where countless military aircraft have been tested, concepts validated, and innovations integrated. Today, on the civilian side, the Mojave Air and Spaceport is the epicenter of privately funded commercial spaceflight research and development. Besides work on the next spaceship, too, there's X-Course space plane for tourists. There's Dave Mastin's lunar landers and Paul Allen's mammoth air launch vehicle, the Strato Launcher. It's the world's largest wingspan airplane. Scaled Composites of Mojave, the same company that built the X-Prize winning Spaceship One and the ill-fated Spaceship Two, is now focused on Paul Allen's gargantuan air launch vehicle. We've built roughly 200,000 pounds of composite structure in what's taking shape behind you, 385 feet wingspan. If you were to put the center line of the airplane on the 50-yard line of a football field, the wing tips are going to hang over the goalpost roughly 15 feet on each side. Security is tight in and around the strata launch hangar. Every shot we take, scrutinized by government watchdogs who work for the Defense Department, worried that pictures showing proprietary technology might get into the wrong hands. ITAR allowed us to show you this wide-angle photograph to give you an idea of just how big this facility really is. Powered by six engines taken from 747s, Strata Launcher is designed to carry a commercial launch vehicle to the upper reaches of the atmosphere, then release it to boost a satellite into space. Flight testing is set to start in early 2016. The motto of Strato Launch is any orbit, any time. America needs the flexibility of this system to get away from, again, the fixed base launch system. This allows you more flexibility, it allows you to launch more frequently, and it allows you to launch in places that obviously you cannot move a fixed base system. The concept is really nothing new. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen is pulling a page from Orbital Sciences playbook. They've been launching Pegasus rockets from the belly of this L-1011 for more than a decade. Up the street from Strata Launcher, Mastin Space Systems, a scrappy startup of overachieving rocketeers, is advancing development of their lunar landers, Zombie and Zero. Over 300 successful test flights between them validating their homegrown technologies. 
So successful, in fact, that NASA is now using these terrestrial test beds to develop new guidance, navigation, and control systems for lander missions to the moon and Mars. The revenue from that and then revenue from some other programs, we're actually able to continue funding the, uh, the new, new vehicles. So we're developing new technologies, we're getting the cost down, we're getting reusability of rocket-powered vehicles way up. The next milestone for Mastin, sending a lunar lander way up, 65 miles into suborbit, and then bringing it down to land within centimeters of where it took off. But Mastin has other irons in the fire. His tiny company, about 20 employees, was selected by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, to design a fully reusable unmanned space plane. Mastin's group will match wits on the XS-1 project with the likes of defense industry giants Boeing and Northrop Grumman. DARPA contract is a big deal for us because that's, well, the, one, that's the largest contract we've ever had. It was a huge evaluation of the work we've been doing. You know, hopefully we're going to upset the apple cart a little bit. Dave Mastin is turning to his neighbor down the street for the propulsion system. x knows all about that. Founder Jeff Grayson and his team have developed a rocket motor that will one day soon propel their Lynx space plane, a pilot and a single paying customer inside, into suborbit. Five, four. Grayson and the nucleus of his crew learned a lot about rocket motors when they worked for Rotary Rocket, a reusable space launch system that failed in the 1990s. So in a sense, the band was too good to break up. And we mapped out a series of steps uh, to ultimately culminate in fully reusable orbital systems. But Xcorp faces the same financial hurdles of many other private spaceflight startups. Outside investment is elusive until the concept is proven. And financial constraints forced Xcorp to ratchet down to start on a smaller scale with a focus now on a powerful yet efficient propulsion system coupled to a space tourism vehicle that will take off, reach the speed of sound in 50 seconds, Mach 3 in three minutes, punch through the exosphere and then glide back to Earth, landing just like an airplane. It has a lot of flight regimes it has to get through, a lot of different Mach numbers, a lot of different altitudes, a lot of different angles of attack. And we don't have a flight control computer, so that all has to be flyable by the pilot. Grayson says the technologies being embedded in the Lynx could one day lead to advancements in the development of their own reusable commercial space launch vehicle. Good out the right While Virgin Galactic and its founder, Sir Richard Branson, have enjoyed the space tourism spotlight for nearly a decade now, x -Corp and Jeff Grayson are flying under the radar, and that's just fine with them. I think... Uh, when we start flying, we'll have more attention than we know what to do with. And it's just fine with me if people uh, pay attention to other activities while we finish the ship. Grayson expects to start flight testing links this year. Over 300 aspiring space tourists have made deposits on their $95,000 flight tickets. It's taken more than a decade to get to this point. But Grayson, like most engineers, understands this business is all about delayed gratification. You work on some project and you have to sustain yourself, in my case, 15 years now, waiting for the moment when you push the button, light the light, and find out whether it all works the way that you thought it was going to work. Not far away, the Spaceship Company, a subsidiary of Virgin Galactic, is working on its first space plane, Spaceship 2-2, well under construction when her sister ship went down three months ago. The price for a ride is $250,000 per person, but George Whiteside says the suborbital experience will be priceless. Well, you're going to have the experience of a lifetime, and for those who are into space, it's going to be the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. Uh, the experience of looking down at our planet from space is something that astronauts say will change you forever and profoundly shift the way that you think about life and, 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 uh, and your future. Build out an early flight testing of Spaceship 2-2 could come in late 2015. Meantime, TSC is also building its own fully reusable commercial space launch vehicle. The mission of Virgin Galactic is to open space to all of us. What we're doing is, is uh, exciting and it's hard and it has risks. Um, but it matters to the future of humanity. It's been said that the real enemy of innovation is the intolerance for risk or some failure. Well, the threshold for intolerance here on the high desert of Kern County is much higher. And that's because the people who run this airport and the innovators who work here understand that without risk, there is no reward.
Something happened in 1903 when two bicycle mechanics decided to be the first guys to fly an airplane. They took enormous risk and it changed the world we live in. I think any kind of opening of a new frontier or testing of a new system, the outcome is unknown. If the outcome were known, there would be no first. We are in the business of hard challenges and in the business of firsts. As Mojave Air and Spaceport Stu Witt likes to say, he's in the permission business. Permission to dream, to build, to test, and to fly. His tenants all agree pushing the envelope of aviation is in our DNA. And it's Witt's job to give people permission to take enormous risks that someday may yield great things for the human race. And for the record, our request to interview Peter Siebold, the surviving pilot from the crash of Spaceship Two, was declined. Scaled Composite says when the time is right, Siebold will speak publicly about the tragic mishap that took the life of pilot Michael Alsbury last October.